Hey friends, it's Steven with Leviathan Sneaks. And for this week's video, we are actually going to be answering a question from one of the comments of last week's video. So in case you haven't checked out last week's video, it is where we talk about some of the harsh truths of starting a reptile business. And one of the things that we talk about in last week's video was that some breeders will produce animals that are just simply not in demand. And because they're not in demand, they struggle to sell them. So somebody had asked specifically, stupid question, but how do you know what is in demand or not? Having lots of listings on Morph Market could either be because it's in demand or because everybody is making them. Just as no or limited offerings could mean it's not in demand or it's quickly sold out slash not long in stock. I'm having a hard time figuring this out. So for this week's YouTube video, we are gonna be trying our best to answer this question right here. We hope you enjoy it. If you do, please hit the like button, leave a comment and subscribe, but let's jump in. When it comes to trying to determine what's in demand and what's not, there's a couple different ways that you can look at this question. One, you could look at individual animals. You could look at individual morphs, but I personally think that that changes. Every single year it's different and there's something else that might be in demand and something that was in demand two years ago may be oversaturated now. So depending on exactly when you get the advice, it might not really be helpful to you. Instead, I think that it's better to try to understand what makes something in demand for a particular segment in the ball python hobby and then apply that in the future. So when it comes to the ball python breeding hobby and trying to determine what's in demand, we're going to be talking about four different segments because I think that what's in demand completely changes depending on the segment that you're looking at. Starting off on the highest and leading edge breeders. What makes an animal in demand for this type of segment, this type of market? And I think that there's a couple different factors. One is if you're looking to get a leading edge animal, you want something that is either the very first one that's ever been produced or one of the first ones and that there is almost nothing else like it on the market. So it's kind of easy to use a specific example for this because it can help illustrate a lot of the points. And for this example, I want to talk about Brock Wagner's Sunset Puzzle that he recently hit. And it is absolutely amazing. It is stunning. It is a perfect example of a leading edge animal that is in demand for this market. So we have this specific animal, which is very, very rare. It's the only one that exists. But it's not just about getting a world's first because anybody could really go on Morph Market and find any random four or five incomplete dominant gene animal pair it to another four or five incomplete dominant gene animal. And statistically, that's very likely that they could hit a world's first from those pairings. But just because you put any random genes together and make a world's first doesn't necessarily mean that it is a leading edge animal that is going to be in demand for this market. Instead, what I think is kind of different about the sunset puzzle versus some random incomplete dominant eight gene combo is that the Sunset Puzzle forms the base for an overall project. And that overall project is the Sunset Puzzle. Because there's so much more room to take it, there is so much more demand because somebody could see the Sunset Puzzle and be like, oh, I wanna put Yellow Belly into it. I wanna put Red Stripe into it. I wanna put Bongo into it. I want to put confusion or acid or anything like that. And that's just going off of like incomplete dominant and dominant morphs. That's not even tapping into the idea of making the sunset puzzle hypo or the sunset puzzle ultra melt, which I'm sure those are going to be absolutely incredible animals. So because it is a leading edge combo and it has so much more room to go, it is part of the reason why it has so much demand and fetches such a high price. Pricing is actually another really, really important thing for this market because nobody is going to go out and buy a 20, 30, 40, 50,000 dollar animal as a pet. Like maybe there's somebody who's super rich who would do that. But for the vast majority of people who are buying animals that are that expensive, they're buying them in order to breed them. So the anticipated value of their offspring is so, so important. 
If you buy an animal and let's say it is a 10 gene incomplete dominant combo that's maybe a clown, you probably are going to be able to get some good money for that animal, but the likelihood of being able to recreate that specific animal is really, really low. So I do think that that kind of limits the upside potential. But if you had the sunset puzzle, getting a sunset puzzle means that if you pair that sunset puzzle to any sunset or any puzzle, you're going to make visuals that are 100% het for the other. And those animals are going to be incredibly valuable for anybody else who is working the sunset puzzle project so because the immediate offspring every single one of them is going to be in demand and valuable their potential offspring will maybe be worth anywhere between five ten fifteen twenty thousand dollars on their own which means that that leading edge animal can fetch a very very high price because the breeder or pretty much any breeder knows that the potential offspring that it will produce will very easily be able to generate a return on their investment. Last aspect that we wanna talk about on what makes a really high-end animal in demand is that it's unique. That it's not simply a little teeny tiny bit better than other combos that already exist, but rather it is wildly better, or wildly different than other combos that exist, and it looks amazing. Because once you get that unique aspect, essentially what it's saying is that anybody else who wants to make an animal that looks kind of like that one, it's the only way that they can do it. So because it's the only way that they can do it, it very quickly makes a situation where the supply is low and if a lot of people wanna make it, the demand is high. And that is the situations where I feel like a high-end animal gets into me. Second segment that we want to talk about are animals that are kind of geared towards those hardcore hobbyist level breeders. And a lot of hardcore hobbyist level breeders would love to get any animal that was in demand for that leading edge kind of segment, but oftentimes hardcore hobbyist level breeders are looking for things that are a little bit less expensive than $20,000. Maybe they're looking at roughly that five to $10,000 range, maybe a little bit lower too. But when they are looking for these specific animals, they're looking for building blocks. They might not have enough money to buy a sunset puzzle, but they might have enough money to invest five, ten thousand dollars and buy a pair of double hat sunset puzzles. So ultimately, these types of breeders are looking for the animals that will be able to jumpstart their projects and get them towards that leading edge stuff. They might not be able to afford the very, very best that exists, but they are going to buy the animals that will let them make the very, very best. So when you're looking at this stuff, I personally think that given with the push towards multi-recessives, the animals that are really, really in demand for the hardcore hobbyist level breeder right now are those that have multiple different recessive genes in them. And this could be double visuals, triple visuals, or maybe a visual with a het or a visual double het. And I also think that they have rare, highly sought after incomplete dominance. So things like Confusion or Lace or Niala or Furrow or really rare incomplete dominant genes like this because those potential genes will allow them to make brand new combos that have never existed before because just not a whole lot has been done with those types of animals. When the hardcore hobbyist type breeder isn't looking to get specific animals to make those leading edge combos, Oftentimes I feel like that they are trying to pick up more rare project type animals that will help them strengthen their foundation or get them into a brand new project. So oftentimes the hardcore hobbyist already have clown, pie, desert ghost, hypo, things like this. And instead when they're looking to get into new projects or expand their current projects into new projects, they are looking at stuff like Sunset, Puzzle, and Monsoon. And again, these will change as time goes by, but really they're looking for recessive type animals that are new, have a lot of potential, and the reason why they want something new with a lot of potential is that they want, they're motivated to make something that nobody else has made before that looks amazing. So I think that in the future, looking for those newer recessives that have a lot of potential and are unlike other stuff on the market, those are gonna be the things that I think that the hardcore hobbyist type breeders are always going to be looking for.
entry level breeders is where I think it drastically changes. And you can be trying to produce leading edge animals and the misses are good for the hardcore hobbyist because maybe you're trying to get a triple visual and instead you made a double visual that is not het after you end up testing it out and a hardcore hobbyist might still wanna buy that double visual. For the entry level breeders, one of the biggest characteristics of this is that they are really, really excited about the hobby. They aren't necessarily locked in to any specific projects once they're kind of buying all of their initial animals. And while they are buying a lot of animals, oftentimes they're on somewhat of a limited budget at any given time for a specific animal. So with all of this said, they're really, really excited. So because they're really, really excited, they don't want to have to wait two to three years to grow up a hatchling female and have their first clutches. I think that entry level breeders very often are looking for animals with size, specifically females, whether these are sub-adult females or breeder females. So that way they can start getting some clutches under their belt and experience all of these things that they cannot wait to see for themselves. So when it comes to this, I think that the animals that best serve the entry level breeders are bigger females that often have a recessive or a het of some sort. So when it comes to the overall breeding market, I think that, as I said earlier, Clown, Pied, Desert Ghost, and Hypo form like the backbone of it. And I think that these are gonna be the specific animals that are really, really good for entry level breeders. A visual clown female, so that way they can start making their own hets or maybe a combo het DG female. So again, they can start making some incredible desert ghost combos for themselves. These are gonna be the animals that I think are really, really in demand. So when it goes into the future, as we progress in the hobby and we move from double recessives onto triple recessives onto quads where, and when I say move on from double to triple to quads, I mean when almost everybody has a triple project or almost everybody has a quad project because while there are some people with quads and there are some people with triples, the vast majority of people don't have those animals. So when the vast majority of the hobby has those animals, the entry level breeders are gonna be looking for the double visuals or they're gonna be looking for some double hets or maybe some triple hets. Again, think about a couple years behind what the hardcore hobbyist breeders are buying. That's what the entry level breeders are trying to buy. Those are gonna be the animals that best serve entry level breeders and will be in demand. Last segment is the pet keepers. And the pet keepers, we actually talked about a little bit in last week's video. Again, if you haven't watched it yet, after this video, head over and check it out. We'll link it in the end screen. But for pet keepers, they're looking for a companion. They want something beautiful that they can display in their home that is going to be well handled so that way they can cuddle with it, they can watch a movie with it, whatever they want specifically with that animal. Probably they want it to eat frozen thawed because it's a little hard to care for a bunch of rodents if you only have one ball python. It doesn't really make sense. They would rather keep some rodents in their freezer and feed it frozen thawed. So all of these things combined essentially doesn't really have to deal with the genetics. I do think that genetics matter, but not so much on like hets or things. It's more about the phenotype, what the animal looks like. So when it comes to what the animal looks like, I think that there's a lot of evidence to show that pet owners are really, really drawn to the bright, flashy, beautiful animals that are inexpensive. So we're talking about like less than $500, maybe less than $300. So because of this, the animals that kind of fit that category and are in that price range are pretty easy. And that is bananas, maybe some banana combos, depending on exactly what genes are with them. Bells, because they're all white snakes with blue eyes and they're just absolutely incredible and stunning. And some low, inexpensive pied combos. I think that these are pretty much the bedrock of the pet market. And if you can consistently produce some absolutely incredible bananas, you can sell these animals fairly well at local shows as long as your prices are right and you market yourself so people are willing to trust you. So. Overall, I actually think that the pet market is a little bit easier because I don't think it changes quite as much as the higher end segments like the leading edge breeders, the hardcore hobbyists, or the entry level breeders. Those animals change giving on the year, but when it comes to the pet market, really it's been bells, pies and bananas for quite a while and I don't see that changing anytime soon. I hope that this was a good answer for the question of what makes an animal in demand or not. I know that I didn't go into a whole lot of specific exact animals, but 
Hopefully this information will be able to give anybody the opportunity to analyze a project and determine if that project is going to be in demand for any given market. So we hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button, leave a comment and subscribe, but we will see you next week.